who's on the bubble when it comes to the 2024 season? More specifically, who are we watching in week one that's on the bubble? Want to give a quick disclaimer here. When I'm talking about teams that we're watching on the bubble, I'm not speaking so much to the matchup as much as I'm speaking to what we want to see from that team as they jump into the more impactful parts of their season. So let's start with Florida State. They already got a game out of the way. They're 0-1, 0-1 in conference play. I think that you can actually, at you know one game into the season, make a pretty strong case for Florida State being a bubble team right now. That sense of urgency for them has got to be there. Has got to be there. Because to keep it a buck, I don't know now how many teams the ACC is going to get in. I'd like to think two, but there's also the potential for them to only get one, and that being the conference champion. So for Florida State, the bad news, and we said this on our reaction sprint on the on our YouTube channel, the bad news is you're 0-1. Especially, you know, more worse bad news is that you're 0-1 in conference play. But the good news is it's not the BCS era. Your season isn't done after one game. You have a chance now to climb back into it, run the table, kind of fix some things internally, fix some things strategically. You go in the ACC, everything is still in front of you. You can still go compete for a national title and all that. It's very obvious, though, now for Florida State. They have to, at the very least, I think, tinker with their equation. Because what I mean by that is when, when we saw Florida State in Ireland against Georgia Tech, we weren't surprised by what we saw from DJU, contrary to what Twitter culture would tell you. He did exactly what we expected. Dink and dunk, be efficient, 70% completion percentage. They didn't push the ball downfield a whole lot even though you should give him credit for pushing the ball downfield when it mattered, but that is what it is. We expected Florida State to be a run the football, stop the run, play good defense kind of team. And a friend of mine, Jake Crane, I thought put it perfectly on Twitter. The issue was for Florida State that when they had no plan A of running the football, playing tough defense, their plan B was not really all that awesome. They didn't have the the jab that we've spoken about a lot on this show, which is you would hope some sort of pass game that can make the opposition pay that wasn't there so they play Boston College on Monday of this week just saying now last year Boston College gave all Florida State could handle and then some all they wanted and then some it was 31 29 was the final so I think Florida State will rebound I think they'll bounce back I think they'll be able to kind of get back on the right side of things just because I believe in Mike Norvell I believe in that roster But Florida State now, you can't drop another one and feel all that great about your chances, especially because that'd be a loss to Georgia Tech and Boston College. I don't think it'll happen. I think Florida State will win. But in some ways, you look at Florida State and you're like, all right, yeah, they're uh, they're probably in bubble territory as much as you can be one game into the college football season. So still a lot in front of them. Whether you're a Michigan fan, you're a Florida State fan, you're a Tennessee fan, whoever you're a fan of in the best sport on the face of the planet, which is, of course, college football. We want you to be subscribed to the On3 YouTube channel so you don't miss a minute of the coverage we have teed up for you this college football season. Michigan, I think right now, without playing a game, you look at their you know path to the college football playoff. Nine and three, I think, would leave you out. They got three big games, Texas, Oregon, Ohio State. Can you go one and two in that stretch? You get Texas at the crib next week. That's going to be awesome, dude. That's one of those games we've had circled for a while now, on this show at least. You play Fresno State in this game, or in this week rather. What I want to see is the pass game rev the engine a little bit. Regardless of who's in the game at quarterback, again, I expect both quarterbacks to play, whether it be Davis Warren or Alex Orgy. I want to see what they have under the hood there. Rev the engine a little bit. Because when you get into a game against Texas, with how talented that roster is. It's too late to turn it on once you play them. It's, it's too late to say, okay, now we go. Like, you got to have the exact same tempo when you play Fresno State, as you do against Texas, as you do against Oregon, as you do against Ohio State. So I want to see their, their quarterback play a little bit comfortable because that's what it's going to take to make a college football playoff appearance. Just telling you right now. The defense, I don't question. The run game, I don't question. The offensive line, I don't question. The question that I have is, do you have a change-up pitch? Do you have something, similar to what we said about Florida State, to where when you don't have that go-to, when you don't have that run game maybe as impactful as you'd like it to be, are you able to throw the football, or do you have something at the quarterback position that's just able to make the differentiating factor for you? 
That's my question for Michigan. So that'll be a lot of fun. Right now, again, they haven't played a game, but I think it's fair to say they are a team to watch to be in that bubble territory with uh, that three-game stretch that they have, or that three games they have overall throughout the course of the season with uh, Texas, Oregon, and Ohio State. Tennessee, the Nico era begins. And y'all that have watched this show, you, you know we feel very, very good about Nico Imaliava and what he's going to be at quarterback for the Vols. They play the mocks this week of Chattanooga. I'm not really holding my breath too much on the outcome of that game. But what I said about Michigan at quarterback is the same thing I want to see from Tennessee. Can you get Nico Iamaliava dialed in? Because after that game, now it's go mode. So it's got to be go mode from the jump in this game against Chattanooga. I want to see Nico all the way comfortable. So when you play NC State the next week at a neutral site, there's no like, okay, get him up to speed, get him acclimated. Like this is a chance now to get some live bullets to feel what it's like in an 11-on-11 setting as the guy at Tennessee. You got it last year against Iowa. It's going to help you. But in this game, I need to see a little bit of the, uh, the it factor from him. I'm not saying I need crazy stats. I just want to see it's like, okay, yeah, like this level is far too easy for him. He's ready to roll when it comes to big-time games in the future. Because we talk about the bubble, 10-2 and two, as an SEC team, I think you feel pretty good about getting in. We said this a lot with Tennessee. On their schedule, it's Bama and it's Georgia. The two games that you circle and you say, okay, from a roster talent perspective, you are more than likely, at this point at least, a little bit at a deficit there. Maybe not a lot, but but enough to where you say those games are going to be tough. You want to create yourself a little bit of uh, some space to work with. You can't lose to NC State. You can't lose at Oklahoma. Can't do it. So get Nico up to speed. Get him ripping and roaring. We'll be in good shape. Now, in terms of the big games for week one, you got USC and LSU. We said it in our prediction video yesterday, or our prediction show yesterday, rather. This is going to be very, very much so a playoff kind of vibe, I believe. Not just because it's neutral site, not just because it's a, a big brand in LSU, but like for USC, if, if you beat LSU, think about the way this would play out. The obvious part is like the confidence and the swag that you are able to garner from getting a win like that is one thing. But in a more literal sense, look at the playoff path. At Michigan, Penn State, Notre Dame. Those are the other like real massive tests that you probably circle right now on the schedule if you're a USC fan. If you beat LSU, I think you probably need to go one and two to feel like you have a chance at the college football playoff. That's all I, that's all I need if I'm a USC fan. I just need a little bit of hope. I need a little bit of hope. And that sets you up, I think, very nicely to have a chance at the college football playoff. Again, it starts with the win over LSU. You probably look at yourself a little bit differently in the mirror as a USC football team if you're able to beat a team like LSU. But again, the path is, I think, what's most intriguing if you're able to beat that team in Vegas. That's going to be awesome, man. I cannot wait for that. Last team I want to talk about here that's you know maybe in that bubble territory, Notre Dame. They go to Texas A&M, college game day. I'm fired up. I'm sure it'll be a million degrees and then some. This is one of those games where you got to win the ones you're supposed to, but you also have to win a couple of these to get to where you want to go if you're Notre Dame. Like, they have, similar to these other teams we've talked about, like sort of a, a few big matchups you circle. At AM is this one, Florida State, and then at USC. You probably got to go one and two in that stretch. And in this game, I think you want to make a pretty solid impression for yourself and also for the people that are ultimately going to be making some decisions on the college football playoff down the line. Like, win this game, handle business, and feel good about everything going forward. I think for Notre Dame in this game, the thing that you're watching, yes, you want to see how the defense plays, you want to see how your portal pieces acclimate on the road, but I mean, speaking of portal pieces, like most important, Riley Leonard is who I think your college football playoff hopes and dreams hinge on. What's the jumping off point for him? I'm not saying there won't be ups and downs because I don't think the growth will be linear for him. But I think when you talk about what you need from him this season, like it's not going to be a more difficult spot to play than at College Station and you know, it, with the eyes of America on you. There, there's no bigger spot. So if there's going to be some growing pains, there's going to be some you know, potential for him to have some hiccups, 
This is the game that you circle. Now, I'm not calling my shot on Riley Leonard. I actually think that Notre Dame wins that game, and I think Riley Leonard is probably a massive part of that. But I'm just saying, what kind of start does he get off to? Again, you go 10-2, you feel okay about your chances, but if you can win this game and then have to go 1-1 one one in the next two against Florida State and at USC in terms of like your big games you have, I think you'd feel pretty good about that. So Florida State, Michigan, Tennessee, USC, Notre Dame, I think all in bubble territory. Are they actually, you know, bubble teams? Remains to be seen. But I think that discussion is healthy as we enter into the beautiful thing that is week one of the college football season. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also, be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.